We bring our study of Paul's letter to the Galatians to a close this morning. With Paul giving some, some final instructions, uh, some final admonitions, if you will, to, uh, to his world and to ours as to what it might mean for uh, the church, the body of Christ, Christians in the here and now, to, to fulfill uh, the law of Christ. This law that, that, that Paul has been uh, laying the foundation for for this church in Galatia. Now, this law is not a list of strict rules uh, for people to follow. That is, is, is put upon the people. Uh, but a law that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And it, it's a law that is, is full of pure grace. Uh, pure uh, love. Extravagant grace, if you will. Now, now th this law uh, does not replace the law of Moses that was given to the people on Mount Sinai, uh, but it's a law that is, has been brought into fruition, if you will, uh, uh, by Christ uh, in the hearts and minds and bodies and souls of, of the, the people of Galatia and all of us who study uh, Paul's letter from that time. All those people who, who, to whom Christ has been revealed, if you will. And now, uh, these people. These people are not who they used to be, but they are a new creation. That's Paul's term. Uh, they they are, are uh, clothed with Christ. Uh, they are the embodiment of Christ in the present. Uh, then in Paul's day and now in our day. They are the church, the, the church universal, the body of Christ, the main avenue by which others will come into the faith or not. You are one of these people. Christ is counting on you and on me. So this letter that Paul has written, it, it, it just... Despite it is so dear to him, despite his failing eyesight, he he, uh, he doesn't use a scribe like he does in many of his letters. But he writes this in his own hand. Verse eleven tells us <coughs> must have been uh, tedious work. It must have taken a, a long time. It must have been difficult to him. But this letter is dear to him. This is Paul's final word to the church in Galatia. So if you will, turn with me to chapter 6 in Galatians. And we will look at the first 10 verses of this text. Hear the word of the Lord. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted Bear one another's burdens, that in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own load. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially those of the family of faith. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In these ten verses, there are five guidelines uh, Paul gives for helping this community uh, of faith walk 
uh, by the Spirit in such a way uh, that they fulfill the law of Christ uh, in a way that they are the, the body of Christ in the here and now, in a way that they are uh, the church, capital C, the church universal. Uh, and and it is, it's built up and it's fulfilling everything that, that Christ had plan for it to fulfill. And I want to touch on these these five uh, these five guidelines, these ten verses this morning briefly. So you may want to keep your Bible uh, open or your phone uh, Bible app available for you. You can uh, walk through these uh, with me this morning. So as we look at verses one and two, uh, verses one and two uh, deal with restoring others to the faith, the Christian faith, uh, and, and deals with uh, bearing one another's burden. Now, I, we need to understand that, uh, that uh, Paul's talking about the community of faith here. Uh, this is a community of faith of like believers. These who need uh, restoring are people who claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But for some reason or another, uh, they have slipped up. Uh, they have uh, backslidden, if you will, for the moment. For some reason, they're no longer representing Christ, nor are they representing uh, what Christ's church should look like. Uh, in their action uh, or their speech. Now remember, Christians are held to a higher standard. We learned last week uh, from James 4, 17 that, that anyone uh, then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for that person, it is sin. They commit sin. Jesus even said to his disciples in Luke 17, verse 1, things that cause people to trip up and fall into sin must happen. It's going to happen. We're, we're human beings. We're, we're fallen creatures. We are going to sin. It's going to happen. But Jesus says, but how terrible it is for, for the person through whom uh, they happen. That's where the church uh, comes in. That's where the church is held accountable for our speech and our actions. The Galatians have been set free by Christ. They know Christ. They know the right thing to do. Therefore, since they are part of the family of faith, we are required to keep them accountable in that faith. But notice what Paul says here. He said, but we are to do so with humility and with gentleness. And that's why Paul says that only those who have received the spirit of gentleness is supposed to do this. We learned last week that, that gentleness was one of the fruit of the spirit. Only those who are called with the spirit of gentleness should even attempt this. Now remember the, pur the purpose of it is to restore the person uh, in the community of faith out of our love for that person and out of our love for the church. No way is Paul giving permission for us to judge another human being. In fact, in, in Matthew 7, 1, Jesus says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. So just to be clear this morning, Paul would never say it would be okay for us to go out and look for sinners so that we can point out their faults and their failures. That would, that would not do any good. That would not restore anyone to the faith, nor would it win souls for Christ. It would only do harm. It would only hurt the church. That's why Paul says that, that uh, we need to be careful that we are not tempted to fall into sin as well. You know, if, if I think I'm better than someone else when I'm trying uh, to help, then my sin is, is self-pride. Our purpose should be that we should help bear the burden with that person. That we should, we love them so much that we want to restore them to the community of faith. If, if we were to go back in chapter 5 and look at some of Paul's words of the flesh mentioned there, 
we can see that several of those things are, are uh, addictions that are almost impossible to uh, get rid of on your own. So if you think about a drug addict or an alcoholic, they need someone with a clear head and a pure heart or a loving heart to help them in their situation. Not to remind them that they've done wrong or remind them that they're a sinner, to which we all are, but to help them, to help get them out of the, the low place that they are and build them back up. So Paul says in verses 3 and 4, he, we, we deal with self-examination. And as, as we think about self-examination, we think of Jesus and what he said in Matthew 7, 3. He says, why do you uh, uh, see the speck in your neighbor's eye but you don't notice the big log in your own eye? And then in verse 5 of that text, he says, you hypocrite, first take out the log of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Several months ago, I was visiting with a man and I invited him to come to church. And he said, oh, he said, I gave up on the church. He said, there, there's, there's nothing uh, in the church but a bunch of hypocrites. And I said, you know, you're exactly right. And that's where we want them. That's where they need to be. So that we can try to, to transform their hearts and their minds to, to the image of Jesus. And he was speechless. And then about a month after that, another man I was busy with, I, I invited him to come to church. And uh, he said, you know, the people in church aren't nice. They're just not nice people. They, they look down at me and they judge me. And I said, the people in this church did that? He said, no, no. He said, it was, it was another church in another town a long time ago, even another state. And then he began to tell me that, that he had no friends at all. And that there was no one that he could ever call on in times of need that, that he could receive help from. And I said, you know that bag of groceries that you're holding in your hands? I said, those were given to you by people in this church who love you for who you are. And if you need some friends, give us a try. Come and, and give us a try. And build those relationships. But I couldn't convince them. But you know it's amazing how many how many people uh, have been hurt by the church. It's going on right now in, in Florida. People judging other people instead of loving other people. There is there is some uh, loving going on there, but there's a lot of judging going on there. You know, if, if people are going to come to Christ through the church. Uh, which, which is Jesus' main plan, by the way. Uh, Paul says that, that we have to do that through our love for one another. Our love for our neighbor. You know, I should wake up every day and ask myself, uh, how am I going to represent Jesus Christ today in my action uh, and in my speech? Because Paul says in verse 5, of our text, that, that we must all carry our own loads. He's not talking about bearing one another's burdens here like he did in verse 2. But Paul's talking about the final judgment here. Now, when we stand before Christ or before God on, on judgment day, we will be judged by the load that we are carrying, and meaning that we will be responsible for our own action in the flesh. Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Whether good or bad. We are accountable more so than those who are not in Christ. Verse 6 of our text deals with financial support for the community's teachers. Uh, Paul basically wants the church to, to take care of those who teach and preach uh, the gospel. He doesn't want them to have to worry about how they were, will survive or, or how their needs will be taken care of. He wants them to spend their time uh, in God's Word and, and using that and, and, and teaching the people. Uh, and so that's why the church has uh, uh, staff. 
why the church employs people. So they can spend their time reaching people for Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9, 14, Paul shared, the Lord ordered those that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. And then quoting Jesus in Matthew 10, 10 about those who teach and preach, Jesus said the worker is worthy of his provision. So we, we have paid preachers in the church. Most, most denominations do it, at least at some, at some extent. All right, verses 7 and 8 deal with sowing and reaping. And we need to, to look at that as we begin with what Paul says as thinking about life here on earth is just a blink. It's just a blink compared to eternity. And Paul's saying that, that even though it seems like there are people in our world who are full of corruption and doing things wrong, when it seems as though that they are getting away with mocking God, uh, they're not. They're not. Second Corinthians 5, 10 that you just mentioned uh, testifies to that. There is a judgment day coming. Everyone will reap what they sow sooner or later. But Paul's concern is that the Galatians are mocking God by not trusting uh, in the provision of grace that God has provided through Jesus Christ for their salvation. And they have reverted back to the salvation by works, specifically circumcision in this case. But any time that we, we seek fulfillment in life by the way of the world instead of the way of Christ and what Christ has uh, available to us, we're mocking God. In other words, we're, we're sowing in the flesh, as Paul would say, and not sowing in the spirit. And the bottom line is the flesh dies. All flesh dies. Spirit lives. The Spirit lives on. So for the Galatians, they were uh, it was it was trying to earn God's favor that Paul was against. If you remember the, the rich young ruler in Mark chapter uh, ten, it was his possessions that kept him from entering eternal life. If you think about the Pharisees in Jesus' day, it was self pride and prestige and power and authority that they were hung up on. I think we need to think about uh, uh, us, each of us, and ask ourselves, you know, what are we sowing? What are we, what are we sowing in our lives? We're all sowing something. Biblical scholar Richard Hayes from Duke Divinity School, speaking about Paul's admonition, says that that sowing to the flesh is not a moralistic warning against sensual self-indulgence. Instead, it's a warning against placing confidence in anything that belongs to the realm of, of the merely human. Paul insists that, that only the Spirit of God has the power to give life. In John 10.10, 10, did Jesus say, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. If we look for that life in other places, we're mocking God, according to Paul. And Paul uses that, that farming term, uh, sowing and reaping, a term that, that still rings true today. He uses it so that we might sow Christ in our church and in our community. And the harvest that we will reap are Christ's followers who become the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in the world, people who will spread the love of God, people who will love their neighbor as their self. And finally, in verses 9 and 10, we're called to continue to do good and to never give up. Now this may be the hardest of all, especially for preachers and teachers of the faith. Because it's easy to get discouraged when we don't see immediate results. When a church is, is half empty on Sunday morning, Satan has a field day of trying to sow doubt uh, in 
and I die. When a member of the faith stumbles and we judge that member instead of helping that member, Satan just belly laughs at us. He's enjoying every minute of it. So Paul says, don't grow weary in doing what is right. For we reap at the harvest. Don't worry about when the harvest is going to come. It'll be here soon enough. Our job is to do what is right. Our job is to sow goodness and, and grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. I want to close this morning with some words from John Wesley. And that's too small for you to probably see from where you are. <coughs> I'm have you, uh, if you can see that, join me I'm going to read John Wesley's quote uh, together this morning. Do all the good you can. By all the means you can. In all the ways you can. In all the places you can. At all the times you can. To all the people you can. As long as ever you can. That's from our family. Paul would totally agree with this point. May we be people who so love, even if we, if we don't agree with, with the people and what they're doing. May we be people who so love that they might know that we are Christians by that love and not hate. Let us pray. Merciful God. Once again, we thank you so much for Paul and his commitment to you and, and his commitment in, in writing uh, to the churches. We thank you for this letter to the Galatians and how for several weeks it has been speaking to our hearts and our minds. And as, as we have, have studied this uh, in depth, we realize that our world is not that much different than Paul's world. Help us, O oh God, to so good in our world that we might bring others to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen.